Thank you, everybody, for coming to my talk on Cyber Threat Intel 101. <clears throat> my name is Daniel Gordon. Thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm a Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst, I'm a contractor, a Lockheed Martin contractor to uh, Department of Defense Cybercrime Center, or DC3, and that's my Twitter handle in case you guys want to hit me up after this, though I will be in the Discord as well. So, um, I'll, this is the overview. I'll talk about who I am. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a definition of threat intel. I'll talk about some subsections of it, and then I'll give some resources to learn more. Though conferences like this one are a great place to learn more. So, uh, you know, thanks, Kellen, and thanks uh, everyone for coming and you know looking to learn. All right, here we go. So, uh, yeah, contractor. Uh, I have a background doing network defense, incident response, and threat intel. I've got a bunch of certifications which I won't really talk about. I've got some degrees which I also won't talk about. Um, I published some stuff on dark reading and war on the rock. So if you like reading uh, more than you like listening to me talk, then you know, go check those out. Um, so cyber threat intelligence. Uh, threat intel is collecting, understanding, explaining threats because of the risk that they present. Um, risk is the reason that in information security exists. So keeping it in mind as the, the the thing that you're looking at or looking for is really important. So what's the definition of risk? Uh, some people define it as uh, cost and likelihood and type of impact um, multiplied together or some other formula for uh, that. Um, some people define it as capability, intent, and opportunity. That's a law enforcement description of risk. Um, and some people just think of APTs as risk. APTs are advanced persistent threats. And really, it's a nickname that people used to describe state-sponsored activity because when there's a country backing something, backing a group, the idea is that they would be more advanced, be more scary, be uh, harder to stop. Um, turns out, uh, for those who uh, pay attention to the threat landscape, there are some uh, APT groups that are terrible and some that are amazing, and the same applies for uh, groups that are not backed by states. So there are some that are really advanced, even though they're criminal groups, and there are some that are, you know, terrible as well. So that's cyber threat intel in a nutshell. Um, let's get a little more specific. Uh, so uh, hunting um, is uh, looking through data for bad bad stuff, uh, both internal to a network and also outside. I'll go into more depth in a second uh, into all of these. Um, it's building and developing effective sharing relationships because uh, that can uh, really help you uh, defend yourself. Um, it's advising decision makers, people who can implement changes, make uh, do things on your network or purchase stuff that can change the uh, the risk level of your network, and also uh, attack modeling or uh, building a campaign. Uh, part of that is attribution. Um, we'll say that there are some folks that are not big fans of attribution. They they think it should be reserved for uh, governments or certain other folks with special visibility, but uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll go into more depth later, but um, I, I personally think that attribution helps, can be useful, and folks should do it if they do it properly, uh, but I'm not going to go into the debate because we'll be here for a year. Um, all right, so hunting uh, is uh, if you want it to be effective, you should come in with a hypothesis, a question you're trying to answer, some uh, an artifact that you want to kind of build from or look look for, uh, because without that initial seed uh, of information that you're working with, you're gonna end up wandering wandering down rabbit holes. You're gonna end up end up uh, not really having something helpful come out of your uh, hunt. Um, so yeah, you then wanna test your hypothesis or try to answer your question using the data that you have available, whether that's you know, log data, whether that's network traffic, whether it's net flow or it's uh, sys artifacts on systems themselves, so host-based artifacts. Um, all of those can are forms of data that you can hopefully use to answer your question or test your hypothesis or you know see if there's something significant that you find. Um, and then it's really important to have output for a hunt. So that means, um, it, is this a change that you uh, put into effect on your network to protect against something? Is it a detection, hopefully an automated one, so you don't have to uh, spend time on it every single day, but a, uh, a way to automatically look for that 
uh, try to answer that hunting question uh, in the future. Um, but you want to make sure you have some kind of substantive output that you can show for for having a hunt. Uh, if without some kind of substance to show or result, then um, you may not have actually accomplished anything. Uh, sometimes that'll just be, hey, there's something on my network that looks broken. Uh, let me go ask somebody to fix this or look at something that needs to get fixed. Um, so it turns out you don't have to just hunt on your network. Uh, there's significant value to folks who have the time and resources to hunt outside their network and find, say, infrastructure that's, uh, say, imitating your your domain that, that could be used against you or um, infrastructure that reflects what adversaries often set up. Uh, sometimes there are ways to pick up on malware uh, that is being tested or uh, being evaluated in other places or purchased. Um, it's helpful to look and see if uh, credentials from your network have been stolen and posted somewhere uh, because clearly that um, would be a problem, uh, <laughs> something that you, you want to go reset their account. Um, sometimes adversaries, uh, bad guys will, or girls, uh, will post stuff on forums or other places so you can pick up on that and uh, take action accordingly. Um, and honestly, if somebody has already stolen things from you and they're trying to sell it somewhere, that's something you'd probably want to know about. So external hunting can tip you off to that as well. So uh, I talked about hunting um, and you know external hunting is part of that. So uh, part of the uh, description of things that you can look for in an external hunt are described in the pre-attack matrix. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the MITRE attack matrix. It's a, a framework for describing activity or a model um, or a taxonomy. And uh, there's a segment to it called the pre-attack matrix, which is are things that happen before the attack reaches a network. Um, so these are things that you could look for uh, it, while externally hunting. All right. So now I've I've talked about uh, hunting. I'm going to jump into sharing. So sharing is helpful for a few different reasons, but one is that some uh, some adversaries will attack, will say multiple organizations in the same. Uh, segment. So maybe they go after telecommunications organizations, or maybe they go after healthcare organizations, or maybe they go after governments. But um, being able to uh, share with other folks in that segment can be helpful. And um, I'll, I have a short video to kind of demonstrate why uh, sharing can be advantageous. Uh, so let me just switch over to this right quick and hit play and pray to the presentation gods. All right, so hopefully you guys were able to see that okay. Um, but yeah, th so the video is uh, just kind of a demonstration. So uh, when when somebody, uh, something that is new to you may be old to somebody else, and if they're sharing their information with you, that may be uh, helpful to stop an attack before it happens and vice versa. So that's why sharing matters. Um, so as I, met, as I mentioned, there are, uh, sharing organization uh, sorry there are sharing organizations within segments so uh ele elevator pitch for dc3 but uh part of uh the services that dc3 has uh is a sharing platform for uh, organization uh clear defense contractors uh, but whatever segment your organization belongs to um there is likely to be some kind of sharing organization set up um, oftentimes they're free they just, uh, because they want people to get involved, they want people to share, uh, but almost anything you can think of, nonprofits, uh, energy and, and safe, energy and power, water treatment, whatever it might be, 
Um, they often are ISACs or ISAOs, and ISAC is an information sharing and analysis center. Uh, ISAO is the same thing with organization on the end instead of center. But uh, it's it's something that folks, you know, I encourage you to, you know, take a look, see what there is uh, for you to take advantage of. And finally, uh, so there are feeds. Um, so uh, there's some advantages to uh, doing this kind of sharing rapidly and uh, in an automated fashion, you know, reduce the amount of human interaction needed. Um, there are a bunch of different formats for exchanging content and uh, I'm not gonna dive into them, but uh, we'll say that none of them are perfect. Um, the, uh, you know, format allows you to instantly kind of take stuff in, take, uh, you know, uh, process things um, and send stuff out as well. I guess I didn't include JSON in there, J-S-O-N. Um, there are also uh, ways to just share, share signatures. So these are detection mechanisms to automatically identify certain things. Uh, these are a bunch of common formats for signatures. Um, YARA stands for yet another recursive acronym and uh, all three of these are very common. There, there are some others, but but these are kind of the most common. Um, there are some uh, feeds out there, so these are uh, free things that you can either subscribe to and get uh, stuff that put out by the Department of Homeland Security or the SANS Internet Storm Center, uh, SANS being an educational organization. Uh, there's also a whole bunch that folks will charge you money for. Uh, so um, it's really helpful to know that uh, we'll say the quality varies and um, that may not vary directly in proportion to price. So I encourage folks to, uh, we'll say, uh, test things out ahead of time if they're able to and validate the quality of what they're getting, making make sure it delivers value um, while they're using it as well. So now I've uh, wrapped up sharing and now I'm gonna talk about briefing. Um, and to talk about briefing, I'm gonna use a, uh, we'll say examples from an interview uh, in 2010 uh, with, there's a news interview with Antoine Dodson. I consider this the best interview that has ever happened um, in history. And um, here we go. So um, when you're briefing folks on a threat, uh, it's helpful to first describe the vulnerability and the technique. So this is giving, an under giving the audience an understanding of the threat, uh, why it's new, why it's interesting, why it, what, what is special about it. Um, Next, you're going to uh, explain likelihood. You need to tell your audience why this is likely to be something that presents a risk to them. Um, so that that really brings it home to most folks. You know, otherwise they may not, you know, actually care because they don't think that it's going to impact them in particular. And then uh, you want to give specific actions for your audience to take. So, um, you know, here's a, a mitigation you can put in place. Here's something you should look out for. Here's uh, something you can spend money on to protect yourself. But this is a very important piece of this uh, that um, some folks, I guess, neglect or uh, don't think to include. Um, and honestly, this this applies to a lot of things that people do in life. It, it, when you write something or uh, give a talk or whatever it might be, it's important to have some kind of action that you want the audience to take. So that's uh, that's my explanation of how you brief folks on a thread. So now we're gonna talk about modeling. Uh, so this is the, I'm going to start off with the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Uh, I'm a little biased because uh, I work for Lockheed Martin, but um, this is a uh, a framework that's been used across industry and government for a long time. It has some flaws. It's not perfect, but um, it at the time it was created, it did a really good job of explaining what an APT attack would do and breaking it into stages. Um, each stage would give you uh, Oh, specific kind of things that you could do to uh, mitigate it, uh, mitigate an attack and understand it. Um, the idea is that all of the stages would be required for adversaries to achieve a goal. Um, and we'll say uh, things have evolved a bit, but at the time it was you know pretty good. Um, there's a, a saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and th this this is, I've seen it be useful. Um, but yeah, each stage uh, is an opportunity to block or detect adversary activity. Um, it's uh, sorry, you'll notice on the on this slide, uh, the first stage is reconnaissance, and then on this one, it's recon and precursors. That's one of the ways that it's kind of evolved because there are things that happen before 
even reconnaissance happened. Um, but yeah, each stage is an opportunity to block or detect. Um, it's also an opportunity to then go and reconstruct the rest of an attack by, um, you know, if, if I stop somebody at the command and control stage at stage six, I can go back and see what stages one through five look like and hopefully take up, uh, take action to detect or block that activity. Um, I can also reconstruct what would have happened if I blocked something early, you know, what would their uh, command and control have looked like. I can put in a block there as well. Um, so a campaign is likely to be multiple attacks, so uh, so multiple kill chains. And the way that you can kind of tie them together or build a model of an attacker is by identifying common things across the um, across these attacks. And one way to uh, make sure that you're not pulling all of your data from the same thing and kind of being biased with what you're talking about is to use one of these frameworks like the kill chain or like MITRE ATT&CK or other ones and say, okay, so this element at stage three matches on attack number one and it matches attack number two. Or, you know, hey, the adversary uses the same user agent string um, in the first attack and the second attack. Uh, so that's a way to have some, uh, we'll say, reliability behind your connections that you're drawing between multiple attacks as you're building a model. So why build a model? Uh, so you're grouping stuff together, building a model, identifying a campaign. These are fundamentally kind of the same thing. Um, and these matter for a few different reasons. But uh, one is that it gives you a picture of gaps um, that you should uh, address. So, um, you know, gaps in your defenses, gaps in your intelligence, whatever it might be. If you're able to predict attacker activity ahead before it happens, that's the gold medal of threat intelligence. Uh, if you predict it ha before it happens, then you can take action before it happens, and that is the best possible outcome for a defender uh, is being prepared before some the bad thing happens. Um, you can also hopefully make risk-based decisions. Um, you can share more effectively if you're able to accurately describe activity in terms that somebody else can understand, then that can help uh, sharing. Uh, it can make your sharing more effective. Yeah, so a, a bunch of possible benefits. All right, so that wraps up uh, modeling. Um, so now I'm going to give some resources, and I swear by Twitter. So um, Twitter definitely has its flaws, but these are some... Uh, prominent people in the Threat Intel community that I recommend people follow. Um, a couple of these folks, as you see, are SANS instructors. Uh, they teach a course related to threat intelligence. Um, but these are some prominent folks that I encourage everyone to follow. Um, and if you want to learn more about cyber in general, these, these are some more accounts that I, I suggest people follow. Uh, some of them are funny or enjoyable, as well as being uh, really great sources of information about cyber. But, um, I do encourage folks to check them out. So yeah, that's my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Awesome. That was that was really good. Uh, I I threat hunt, so like I was just like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, no, so we have a question, and I think it's a good question. Uh, a lot of people probably have similar thoughts about this, but. How do you assess whether a particular threat intel feed is worth the subscription price for their for an org? You know, that's that's a great question. Um, so uh, there are a few different ways. Uh, one is um, you see. So so what? Anytime you get an indicator, one of the measures of uh, value is going to be a true positive to false positive ratio, uh, because uh, false positives being uh, hits on things that are not significant and true positives being things that are significant. So if you have, um, if you're getting things in your feed and you uh, task them or block on them or whatever it might be, and they start uh, producing value um, or by blocking things, or uh, you want to see if you're blocking what you want to block. Um, so uh, if you start blocking um, like legitimate emails from people that you care about, maybe uh, you're not getting good value out of uh, what you're receiving. If you start blocking uh, actual bad guy activity, that's that's a good sign. Um, 
but uh, the ratio kind of matters. Uh, there's also, um, we'll say, uh, there, there are some things you can get for free uh, on the internet and hopefully you can compare things that you're paying for against what, you, what you're getting for free and see if paying for it makes sense. Awesome, yeah. Um, let's see here. This is a good question about uh, getting into Threat Intel and just job postings. They've seen um, a lot of postings require language skills, uh, like Russian or something like that. What are, What are your thoughts on that? Um, so that that is definitely a a section of Threat Intel to uh, kind of do research on uh, folks uh, who are um, you know talking about hacking in uh, forum foreign language forums or uh, in you know, on the internet. Um, and I would say that uh, there's a lot of threat intel that you can do without having language skills. I personally have, I, I speak mediocre Spanish, so I uh, do not have much in the way of language skills that come in handy. But um, the, uh, yes, that can be helpful uh, if, some of the organizations that are posting those kinds of job openings are going to be, we'll say, the, some of the more mature uh, threat intel folks um, that uh, you know are are pushing the boundaries of where what kind of information they're able to take in. But honestly, most organizations that um, have their kind of uh, understanding of their network together at all. Um, might also benefit from a threat intel capability, which when probably wouldn't involve combing like foreign language forums for, uh, you know, who people are hacking. Right, right, yeah. Um, let's see also, here. Uh, also, Google Translate exists, so you know uh, that that can get you somewhat. D don't apply for a job based on that, but you know, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it helps. Yeah, it definitely helps. Um, so let's see here. I always hear about CTI feeds for large companies. How does that work? Where does the information come from? Uh, so it comes from lots of things. Uh, they, some of it will be like honeypots that they have set up to kind of collect uh, random malicious things that are happening on the internet. Some of it will come from endpoint sensors that they have. So that means like, uh, you know, if they if they provide antivirus to folks, then uh, stuff that their antivirus is catching, um, some of it'll come from things that humans are actually researching and doing. Um, it's often a feed is an aggregation of a whole bunch of junk, and um, we'll say that that's part of the reason the quality can vary because uh, some of those sources are better at collecting. Uh, things that matter and some of them are not as good. Right, right. Um, how would one take the first step to get into threat intel? Great question. Um, the There are folks that say that you should have an incident response background or a forensics background or some kind of understanding of what an attack looks like before doing threat intel. Um, I I mostly agree with that. There are folks that uh, just are good writers and like reading about what bad guys are doing and writing about it, and that can make for uh, some, you know, that that kind of neglects some of the hunt part of it. But um, you know, there are folks that are fantastic at sharing and briefing and are therefore able to be good threat intel analysts. There are also folks that excel at hunting and are terrible at briefing. Um, I am. <laughs> Hopefully not one of them. Uh, but the idea is that uh, trying to be all of those things together uh, isn't necessary uh, to be a threat intel analyst. There could just be um, something, you know, you're good at understanding adversary activity and describing it, um, and that might be enough. Uh, yeah. I, just to build off our keynote this morning, you know, like you can come into InfoSec with a lot of different experiences and provide value um, because your background is diverse and I think that's huge in threat because like you might have a different idea of how people work based on your background that really helps the threat intel yes that is absolutely correct and honestly I'm I'm proof of that my my degree with my undergraduate degree was political science I uh, 
you know, I, I built some, uh, well, say technical know-how, but uh, the, being a good threat intel analyst does not require uh, being um, coming from a, any specific discipline or background. Yeah, awesome. Um, let's see. Ooh, one one last question here. Uh, so, could you briefly share your hypothesis on how some attacks may have been orchestrated? For example, something like Equifax. Uh, my opinion on how they were orchestrated. Um, I uh, <laughs> um, so I, the Equifax breach, I think, was uh, publicly attributed to uh, a Chinese um, hacking group. Uh, how it was orchestrated, uh, I um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that uh, if there are some situations where uh, hacking groups are tasked to do things. So uh, some somebody uh, tells them to go hack something. Um, and there are some that are more opportunistic, meaning that uh, they notice that a organization is vulnerable. They think it will have some value. And then they go, uh, they go after it because of that. Um, but uh, I have, uh, may, may, maybe I'm not uh, interpreting the word orchestrated properly, but I, I that's the best I can do for uh, for describing that. Um, yeah, no, I, I I think that makes sense. 